Welcome to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. We can also find us in the Birmingham Bloomfield area on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and on City Cable 15 of Southfield. Join us live on Channel 10 in Waterford every day on the media network of Waterford and live to tape on Channel 10 in Lake Orion and Orion Township on Orion Neighborhood Television. You can also find us on the radio in the Birmingham, Bloomfield, and Troy areas on the Biff Radio Network, 88.1 FM, the Biff, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District with 24-7 operations out of Bloomfield Hills High School. Find us online on our Facebook pages at Civic Center TV 15 and at Lakes FM, on our website at civiccentertv.com and on My Michigan TV or My My at MyMyTV.com. That's M-Y-M-I-TV.com, where you can also learn more about downloading their free apps for your smartphones and smart TVs. All of that information is on our website at CivicCenterTV.com by clicking on our Megacast link or going to CivicCenterTV.com slash Megacast uh, when you type the website into your browser. Where you can also find all of our programs on demand and find each individual interview as well, so you can watch the Megacast in its full two-hour form on your on your own time or watch individual interviews of your interest level uh, and of and from expertise uh, experts that you want to hear from then let's head over to our news page at civiccentertv.com slash local dash news where we have links to the most up-to-date information on COVID-19 from reliable resources at the CDC the MDHHS and the Oakland County Health Division so that you can stay up to date on everything you need to know about the spread of COVID-19 Precau precautionary tactics that are uh, suggested or even in some cases required in certain areas of Michigan and beyond as well as where you can get vaccinated and receive a booster shot or booster shots should you be eligible. Also on our news page at civiccentertv.com by clicking on our local news link at the top of the page you will find articles from many journalistic outlets all across the state of Michigan in order to keep you updated on COVID-19 and other stories making headlines all throughout the Great Lakes State. Our top story today is from Lily Altavena of the Detroit Free Press. Oxford High School students yesterday walked out of school in support of victims in Uvalde, Texas, uh, who were, of course, uh, involved in a school shooting earlier this week. More than 100 Oxford High School students walked out of class on Thursday about lunchtime, fi uh, filling out out, sorry, filing up out of the double doors of the school to congregate on the football field. The action was a show of support for students, faculty, staff, and families coping with the massacre earlier this week at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, according to an educator who declined to give their name to the D Detroit Free Press. The students stood on the field for a few minutes, forming the shape of the letter U, exchanging hugs, and then filed back into school uh, about 12.35 p.m. Denise Dublensky, spokeswoman for the Oxford Community School District, wrote in a statement that the district was made aware of the walkout planned at schools across the country by Students Demand Action, a national advocacy organization against gun violence. Quote, as a community, our hearts are with Uvalde, and we understand why some of our students chose to participate in the national walkout, and closed quote, the statement had said. Dublensky also added that the additional trauma specialists are available to students this week and in the days to come at Oxford as students hear the news from Texas. Emily Bush, a parent of a freshman student at Oxford High School, said she was proud to watch her child participate. Oxford High School itself was the scene of a November 30th mass shooting last year, which killed four students, including uh, an injured, six others, and a teacher. Also making headlines on our local news page at civiccentertv.com slash local hyphen news from Melissa Frick of, the, of MLive. Quote, it's their obligation, Michigan Boots, 19 candidates, that's right, 19 candidates from the August 2nd ballots over petition errors and fraud. 19 candidates from around the state have been booted from the August primary ballots over petition errors. These errors are ranging from some candidates having thousands of fraudulent signatures on the petition to one candidate accidentally covering a few words on her petition with a sticker. The Michigan Board of Canvassers on Thursday decided on a total of 32 cases where candidates for this year's primary elections were facing disqualification from the ballot. The list includes six candidates for governor, seven for U.S. representative, and 19 for circuit court and district court judges. Of those 32, only 13 candidates qualified for the ballot after the Board of Canvassers found their petitions to be sufficient during its Thursday, May 26th meeting. The other 19 candidates were disqualified and will have to file an appeal in court before June 3rd, that's next week, if they want to get back on the ballot. Five Republican candidates for governor were among those disqualified 
disqualified from the ballot after they submitted thousands of fraudulent signatures on their petitions. Those candidates were James Craig, Perry Johnson, Donna Brandenburg, Michael Markey Jr., and Michael Brown. In Michigan, in order to earn the place on the ballot for the primaries, candidates must circulate a petition and gather a specific number of valid signatures, keyword valid, signatures from registered voters in the correct jurisdiction. The rules for petition gathering are strict. Candidates must ensure that signatures are from valid registered voters and that every word of information on the petition is correct, even if they hire other people from outside organizations or from uh, or just individuals to be affiliated with their campaign to go out and, and uh, canvas for these petition signatures to get them on the ballot. They have liability. The candidate themselves has the full burden of proof that these are, in fact, valid signatures. And they sign that away. It's not those people that they're hiring in. They're responsible to do their job. They're hired by these campaigns to do a job. But it's not solely on them to ensure that these are valid signatures and that campaigns do their due diligence. That, of course, is on a candidate. And frankly, if I can speak candidly here, if you don't take your due diligence to cross your eyes to cross your T's and dot your I's, see I corrected myself there unlike the candidates, on your petitions, who's to say you're going to be careful and deliberate in your actions as a leader? It brings that to question. That's why they have these regulations in place. And for those on the Republican side who questioned the validity of so many votes and registered voters in the 2020 election, if election security is a concern for you, and it should be for all people on all sides of the aisle, you want to make sure those signatures are real. Don't put dead people or fake people or people that aren't in that correct jurisdiction on your ballots. A lesson learned for next time. Continuing on in this article from M Live's Melissa Frick, the Board of Canvassers upheld those rigid rules on Thursday during an eight count an eight hour meeting where state officials poured over reports on petition issues for all 32 candidates. Some of the candidates argued they were victims to disingenuous petition circulators and should not be held responsible for having, in some cases, thousands of fraudulent signatures. Other candidates asked for understanding from the state, arguing that their mistakes were simply due to human error. Vice Chair Mary Ellen Gurowitz, who uh, one of two Democrats on the four-member board, upheld that it is a candidate's responsibility to ensure the petitions they hand in are valid and correct, saying, quote, some of the candidates admitted that the signatures are fraudulent and complained themselves that they were defrauded, that they were the victim, which is hard to stomach, quite frankly, and closed, quote. She continued on by saying, quote, it's their obligation to check these signatures, and closed, quote. 36 petition circulators could face criminal charges at as the State uh, Department of State has referred this issue to the Attorney General's office for investigation. Board Chairperson Norman Schinkel, a Republican, opposed the removal of gubernatorial candidates from the ballot. Uh, Schinkel had harsh words for the petition circulators found to be submitting large numbers of fraudulent signatures. He said the following, or some of the following, quote, My comments are that these people should, go, should all go to prison, the circulators that defrauded the candidates and are defrauding us. And closed quote. Board members called some of the, the decisions quote, quote unquote gut wrenching and quote unquote brutal when candidates were booted from the ballot over minor errors on petition sheets. You think, for example, of one petition sheet that was inadvertently covered by a sticker and that was the only error. It's a human error, but an error nonetheless. In one case, the board spent 20 minutes scrutinizing a challenge against Mark uh, Caroy, a district court judge candidate who was found to be. 43 valid signatures short of the requirement because of a faulty date on some of his petition sheets. Quote, is this a number two or is this a scribble, Gurowitz asked, while passing the petition sheet over to board chairperson Schinkel seated beside her. The board ultimately voted to disqualify Caroy from the ballot over his petition errors in a three-to-one vote with Schinkel voting against the decision. Quote, I cannot stress hard enough, having been in this position for a long time, take your time, make sure that everything is correct said board member Jeanette Bradshaw, a Democrat, before voting to disqualify Caroy. The 19 candidates disqualified from the ballot now have the opportunity to appeal that decision in court. It's not over just yet, but they will have to get it sorted out in court before June 3rd. The state needs to have its primary election ballots finalized by June 3rd so that absentee ballots can be printed and proofread, as we discussed yesterday with West Bloomfield Township Clerk Debbie Binder on the Michigan Megacast. You can find that interview online on civiccentertv.com by clicking on our Megacast link. 
Ballots get, sick, get sent to military and overseas voters on June 18th and to all other absentee voters beginning on June 23rd. The board of two Democrats and two Republicans agreed on most of the votes, but different in some. In five cases for the Republican gubernatorial candidates, the vote was split two to two along party lines. Because of the stalemate, the board did not accept the staff report that the five candidates' petitions are insufficient. However, an affirmative majority vote is required to add names to the ballot, meaning those five candidates were disqualified essentially by default. There were also three to one votes, two where Schinkel voted not to disqualify judicial candidates Caroy and Chastity Youngblood, and one where Bradshaw voted against putting gubernatorial candidate Tudor Dixon on the ballot. Below is a list of candidates, and this is in the article, it's a shorter list that we have, of candidates who did and did not qualify for the August 3rd ballot, starting with those who were disqualified. Those are all that we included. Among the 19 disqualified, what we focused in, in our summary on our uh, in our summarized version or shortened version of this article on our website on the gubernatorial candidates, which include Donna Brandenburg for the office of governor, Michael Brown for the office of governor, former Detroit police chief James Craig for the office of governor, and businessman Perry Johnson for the office of governor. That complete list of 19 disqualified candidates and all the candidates that were qualified by the state board of canvassers is in this full article from MLive, which is linked on our website, civiccentertv.com slash local dash news. Lastly, making headlines on our, on our local news page from the Detroit News is Mike Martindale. Veterans are planning to sit out the Memorial Day parade in Royal Oak over a controversy over the parade route. Memorial Day parades have been a tradition in Royal Oak for decades, but some veterans say they have decided to sit this one out. At least three veterans groups that normally march or ride on floats in the annual parade have dropped out over a change in the parade route, which they told the Detroit News will exclude disabled and elderly veterans from participating. The net loss will be about two floats, several vehicles, and 60-plus flags of flag-waving marchers from the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and Disabled American Veterans Organizations. Quote, this is not a political protest, stressed Tom Roth, commander of the Le American Legion, post number 253, continuing on, quote, but when it became clear that the many of our veterans would not be able to participate, we decided not to march as an organization. Because of the ongoing Main Street work, the city moved the traditional route of Monday's parade two blocks west to Washington and then north to Sherman, veering off to 11 Mile Road. Because of a, because of a, vi a viaduct in the area, Parade participants will be asked to board city-provided buses at the viaduct to shuttle them to ceremonies at the new park between City Hall and the Business District. Critics say the new arrangement will limit those physically able to climb on and off buses and, and later leave them standing or sitting in the middle of Troy Street during the event. Quote, Oh, sorry, John, uh, John quote-unquote, Willie Williams, a U.S. Navy veteran, belongs to the DFW, DAV, and the American Legion. Quote, people call me Parade Willie because I usually am one of those encouraging participation and settling thing, and setting things up, said Williams, who also sits on the parade events committee. He continued on by saying, quote, not this year, and closed quote. Williams said he will attend the ceremony at the War Memorial, which honors 188 men and women with Royal Oak ties who have lost their lives in military service since the Civil War. Roth said he and others plan to do the same, saying, quote, we wouldn't miss it, and closed quote. City spokesperson Judy Davids said she has been notified by two veterans groups and at least two community organizations that they will not participate in this year's parade. Quote, we had two, 492 participants in the parade last year and an estimate, and we're estimating that this year there will be even more, approximately 518 total this year without those four groups, said Davids, continuing on. The only explanation I heard was that the change in the parade route made it too short and they didn't feel it was worth the effort, and closed quote. Davids said the parade route was altered on the advice of the city's police department for public safety due to Main Street road work. Carol Hennessy, the 76-year-old president of the Royal Oak Memorial Society, which supervises the upkeep, the upkeep of veterans' graves in the city, said she and her organization were in charge of the parade until a few years ago when she was told by two commissioners, quote, I was too old. And closed quote. When the route change was first announced in March, her organization and others were rebuffed when they suggested alternate routes. Quote, they didn't want to hear any other options, and closed quote, Hennessy said. Jerry Gorski, the current VFW National Committee of Administration member and ex-VFW state commander, said the no-shows will be evident to those familiar with the parade. Quote, there will be some vets involved, but what citizen, when citizens don't see honor guards or vets carrying flags down the street, I expect they're going to ask questions. This will not be a normal Memorial Day 
Parade. All those headlines are on our website, civiccentertv.com slash local hyphen news, as well as those ever helpful links to up to date and accurate information from the co on COVID-19 from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division. We have a great program ahead on this Friday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Coming up, we'll speak with Vic Sidev and Jennifer Alter from the first ever Diamonds Direct store in the state of Michigan, located right here in Oakland County. Then at the bottom of the hour, psychotherapist Ronnie Hormel from the Birmingham Maple Clinic joins us to talk mental health on the Oakland County Megacast. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources, call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. We work together to protect water resources for everyone. Most of the pollution entering our rivers is carried by rainwater that runs off roads, parking lots, and rooftops. Our rain garden helps catch stormwater runoff. Rain gardens and their plants help dirty runoff soak into the ground. You can do your part to help keep our water clean. Learn about rain gardens and native plants. So consider a rain garden in your home landscaping. Catch the runoff with a rain garden. There's one water and it's ours to protect. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was gonna die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary, and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not get your vaccine? I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith. Learn more about the program at civiccentertv.com's Megacast page at the top of the homepage or on the left margin on your mobile phone, where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. With us now is the store manager at Diamonds Direct, now located in Troy, Vic Sedev, along with Jennifer Alter, joining us on the Megacast. Vic, Jennifer, thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate having you both on. So earlier this month, Diamonds Direct opened its first Michigan showroom on Big Beaver Road, just west of Crooks in Troy. For those that are not familiar with Diamonds Direct, and we can start with you, Jennifer, can you tell us about the company? So the company has been around for probably about, what, 30, 30 years, 50 years ago, 19. Well, we started in 1960s, but we started our first retail outlet in 1995. There we go. Right. 
right. So then we just brought ourselves to Troy, Michigan. As of a week ago, we opened up. So it's the first in the state of Michigan. What? Where, where did the decision come from to make the city of Troy the location of choice for Diamonds Direct as it enters Michigan with its first showroom? Troy's a destination um, for shopping. With Somerset being right down the street, it's not just, Troy's not someplace you just go because you're just driving down the road and you end up shopping. It's, it's a destination. What Troy offers the community and retail services is something that Diamonds Direct definitely couldn't pass up. We're joined by Jennifer Alter and Vic Sedev from Diamonds Direct in Troy, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Vic, you're the store manager of Diamonds Direct in, in Troy. Tell us about that showroom uh, and its, at its Troy location and what makes that such a unique place for people to explore the products provided by Diamonds Direct. Well, I think ever since we opened up uh, our first retail uh, location, I think we've changed uh, the landscape of like fine jewelry, right? Our concept is uh, we've uh, simply eliminated the middleman, and then we bring the, the savings directly to the end customer. And then just the, the inventory that we have, the selection that we have, the, the brands that we carry, it's like no other. Agreed. We're joined by Jennifer Alter and Vic Sedev from Diamonds Direct, located in Troy. It's their first showroom in the entire state of Michigan, located on Big Beaver Road, just west of Crooks, in the bustling metropolis of Troy. They're joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. And, and so it owns its own diamond, diamond mines for uh, for. Uh, ethically sounded and sourced diamonds and, and cuts out the middleman, as, as you said, and as it's marked on right. your website. So as you're putting these products together and you're then and then getting them to market and getting them to the consumer, how does the process that Diamonds Direct goes through to bring these products to market, set them apart from other competitors in the local area here in Oakland County, but also across the board and all, in all the places that Diamonds Direct is located across the union? So one of the unique things that we do here at Diamonds Direct by having, being started off as a wholesale operation and having our access um, to our mines in Israel is when the, the owners of the company in the beginning would have the diamonds, have them cut, and basically they would look at the selection that they have in their, like a lot. And at that point, they would pick 20% of those diamonds that they wanted to use within Diamonds Direct so that we could give those to our customers. And the other 80% they actually put out into the market for the other jewelry companies out there to purchase for themselves. We're joined by Vic Sedev and Jennifer Alter from Diamonds Direct in Troy, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Their location is at Big Beaver Road, just west of Crooks, in the city of Troy. You can find them there uh, in, the, in their store. And so uh, tell us about some of the products, Vic, that are featured at Diamonds Direct's location in Troy for those that may be looking to purchase some jewelry and want to purchase some in the local area. Well, I would say we're the one-stop shop for, for all the bridal necessities. Uh, any any brand, any product that you can think under the roof, we have it. If we don't have it, we'll create it for you. Uh, and we're not your conventional jewelry store. Um, you have to come in, check us out to see the Diamond Direct difference. Uh, the way we we go about things here is unlike anybody else. Agree. Yeah. And so as people are shopping for for jewelry and especially for diamonds and, and they're going to shop around, they're going to go to multiple different places, hopefully uh, for your sake, they do make a trip over to Diamonds Direct in Troy and explore, your, uh, explore your catalog of products over there. But what are some tips you have for people that are exploring uh, making a purchase of jewelry or, or of diamonds or, or of some combination of both as they're doing their shopping and they're looking for that perfect product? So one of the things that I always tell people when you're starting to shop and if you're looking for that engagement ring, are you looking for that special piece of merchandise? You need to make sure whoever you're working with that you trust them. Trust is a very big factor in purchasing something that's so monumental to them. So once you have the trust factor, then you need to make sure that you're dealing with somebody who has a large enough selection that you're able to really choose what you want, that you're not choosing from just three or four diamonds, 
we actually have hundreds of diamonds that you can choose from within our company. So really trust and being able to choose are the two top things that I would say are important when shopping. And, and how does, oh, please Vic, continue. No, no, go ahead. Uh, and so how, how does your team over at Diamonds Direct help support those factors as, as people are going through their shopping to make it a smooth but informative experience for those that are shopping at Diamonds Direct in Troy? Well, we, we highly believe in uh, personalized education. I think that's one of uh, the places that Diamonds Direct is very different. We, we love educating the customers. We believe in that personalized education where it's not just about selling, selling, selling. It's about also educating the customers. They can make a smart decision for, for themselves based on, of course, their needs. More information can be found on DiamondsDirect.com. That's DiamondsDirect.com for more information about the, the entire company and about their location in Troy, the first showroom in Michigan for Diamonds Direct, located on Big Beaver Road, just west of Crooks in Troy, Michigan. They are joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. We're joined by Jennifer Alter and Vic Sedev from Diamonds Direct in Troy. And, and so in terms of the business side of things, how has the, some of the, uh, the qualms of the current market across the board, the, the supply chain, certainly inflation and gas prices, how has that all affected the business of selling diamonds and jewelry? Has it had a big effect there as it has in so many other industries, especially in retail? Um, definitely being in retail, uh, during everything that's happened within the last couple of years, we've noticed that people have had to cut out a lot of things that cause, in their social life, traveling, dinners, hosting parties, all of those things, unfortunately, people just had to eliminate. So any of the money that they used to put aside for their family vacations or their entertainment, they actually have really invested in it into retail products. So anything of a luxury brand within the last couple of years has definitely increased. Uh, people put their money back out there and stimulated, stimulated the market. And with jewelry being luxury and being something that maybe they didn't want to spend their money on previously or couldn't quite afford, after staying home for so long and not being able to travel, people really invested in things that they've always wanted. We're joined by Jennifer Alter and Vic Sedev from Diamonds Direct, located in Troy, the first Michigan showroom for Diamonds Direct in the entire state. It's located on Big Beaver Road, just west of Crooks in Troy. More information can be found on DiamondsDirect.com. And, and, and Vic, uh, we're certainly in a different time in, in terms of COVID-19 than we were a year ago and definitely from two years ago, but people still have their concerns. So if someone is hesitant to make a trip to Diamonds Direct's location in Troy and they'd like to explore your products or speak with an expert from your team, uh, I see on your website that there are virtual appointments available. Uh, how can people go about scheduling some of these appointments and what sort of virtual opportunities are there to learn more about your products uh, over the web instead of going to the store? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, there, there are some people who are still apprehensive about physically being in a store. Uh, that's why we have a virtual assistant uh, on our website. So a customer basically goes to our web website and then they can schedule a virtual session with one of our diamond experts. And then basically at that point, everything that you would be doing in a store is done through uh, a virtual uh, appointment. And we, we're still gonna follow all the steps and all the education and. Um, walk them through all the different products and um, go from there on. More information can be found on DiamondsDirect.com. That's DiamondsDirect.com for more information. You scroll down to the virtual appointment section and click on request an appointment and you can make an appointment virtually as well as go to their location located on Big Beaver Road, just west of Troy and uh, just west of Crooks in Troy, Michigan. We are joined by Jennifer Alter and Vic Sedev from Diamonds Direct in Troy, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, Vic, what's, what's unique and interesting about about uh, sales with Diamonds Direct also, is your after sales services like complimentary jewelry maintenance and your 110% upgrade policy. Can you tell us about these two services that are provided in addition to the products that are sold by Diamonds Direct? Yeah, I mean, as you said, 100% complimentary after sales services. We don't charge anything. Uh, unlike uh, all the other jewelry stores, um, right from rhodium plating, refinishing, polishing, any sort of like minor repair or even like a major repair, I would say, uh, it's free for life. And you don't have to pay extra. You don't have to buy 
a, a service plan or a maintenance plan for that. It's complementary with everything that we sell. Uh, talking about the 110% upgrade, we're the only ones in the industry who are offering that. Uh, so anything that you buy from us, uh, not only you're eligible to trade it in, we in fact give you 10% more than, than you paid us. Of, of diamonds. Of the diamonds, yes, right. correct. So diamond engagement rings, diamond pendants, and diamond earrings. Correct. More information can be found on diamondsdirect.com. That's diamondsdirect.com. And so for those that are interested, they like what they've heard, they want to explore some of the jewelry, some of the diamonds, they're looking for that perfect product, and they'd like to speak to some friendly experts in the local area. What are your, your hours in your Troy showroom? We are open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. till 7, and Saturdays we are open 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. And again, more information can be found on diamondsdirect.com. Just another couple minutes with the two of you before we'll say goodbye today. So before we let you go, anything else that we haven't discussed about Diamonds Direct, about its showroom in Troy, the first of its kind in the state of Michigan, or anything else we haven't discussed today that you would like to touch on? One thing I do want to mention, um, when coming in and shopping with us, there is an education. We briefly touched about it. But we actually put our, our customers through an education process. So when they come in, they will learn start to finish about the four C's. They will learn about certifications. They will learn about the rep report. They will learn how to buy a diamond. Um, we definitely do not want anyone ever leaving. Even if they purchase or not purchase from us, they are going to be educated when they walk out of here. It is something that the company takes you know, huge pride on doing and all of us have been trained from the very beginning to make sure that we can give 100% education to the customer. Vic, Jennifer, thank you very much for being with us. Welcome of Diamonds Direct to Oakland County and of course to the state of Michigan. Their first location in Michigan is in Troy. Thank you very much for joining us on the MegaCast. We're gonna take a break on the program. When we come back, we'll talk mental health with the Birmingham Maple Clinic. That's next on the Oakland County MegaCast. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program at civiccentertv.com on our Megacast page, you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. As we begin our slow emergence back from the heights of the pandemic, there are a lot of, there's a lot of pressure put on people to get back to normal. For some, the pandemic had lasting effects on their overall health, including their mental health in a number of different ways and for a number of different factors. Joining us now to talk about this is psychotherapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic, Ronnie Hormel, with us 
now on the Megacast. Ronnie, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to be here this morning. And it's funny, I was just uh, listening to your previous um, guest, and our, we are directly located next to Diamonds Direct. Oh, very interesting. Okay, well, <laughs> your new neighbors are very gracious. We appreciated having them on, and uh, appreciate great. having you on as well. So first off, uh, please tell us about yourself and your specialties and the kinds of patients that you are typically treating at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. So uh, Birmingham Maple Clinic is um, really cool and unique because we really see a diverse group of people, um, which I know sounds very vague, but um, we see, we have specialists that work with, um, we have specialists that work with addiction, panic, um, certain depression, like play therapy as far as kids, um, addictions. So I really feel lucky as well as we have psychiatrists that work with us for patients that also might need medication management. Um, so I feel really lucky because I work at a cool place which is super diverse and a lot of us have our different interest in niches. And so for you as a psychotherapist, having met with patients and had a variety of different conversations on, on your patient's mental health and yeah. on outside factors impacting their life during the COVID-19 pandemic and then other and from other clinical information as well, we've seen and have heard so much over the course of the pandemic about the rise in alcohol use and in alcohol abuse and the, and the ways that that's impacting people's overall health, including their mental health. We've seen Absolutely. that increase happen. What are some of the factors that have led into that increase over the course of the pandemic? So there's a few. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like the biggest one probably that I've seen, um, but I do talk a lot to my colleagues about it, is a lot of anxiety. And it's the uncertainness and, you know, it's coming from so many different areas. So the pandemic was kind of unique in that it brought a lot of different stressors all at the same time that are pretty high up their stressors. So like, let's say, um, you have a chronic illness or a family member or a loved one does, this pandemic's happening, you're worried about their health, you may be worried about your job, you may be worried about your kids' schooling. So all of these little things that can pop up that can be pretty high in the Richter scale of stressors for a lot of people might have been happening all at once. Um, and there's another thing that a lot of people really didn't factor when it came to the use of drinking, which can be related to anxiety as well, is boredom right? People were bored, um, just not driving, maybe staying home more and just like, oh, my, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm bored. What am I going to do? I'm going to watch a movie and maybe have a couple cocktails, have a couple glasses of wine. And, and so with the variety of different reasons that have factored into this increased use of alcohol and increased abuse of alcohol yeah. seen in patients over the course of the pandemic, how do you as uh, mental health professional and others uh, in, that are your colleagues at the Birmingham Maple Clinic and others in the uh, profession as well, then yeah. go about treating that or addressing that issue and trying to you know, bring some sense of normalcy back to the overall mental health landscape and on top of that address this issue before it becomes its own major problem across the board in our society and in our community. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, there's a there's a thing called gray area drinking, which is where you're not necessarily rock bottom alcoholic, you're not having major um, losses, right, whether it be due to missing things, getting fired from jobs, missing appointments, but you're also not just a very casual drinker. So some of the warning signs are you maybe feel a little bit concerned about your drinking, right? Like you may be a little bit like, oh, am I doing this more than I did before? Um, and you're drinking to deal with emotions. So one of the things I'm just gonna kind of touch on both of your questions right there is um, really dealing with your central nervous system, really taking care of it. So right now the weather's getting nice, it would be get outside, spend time in nature, spend time with people you love. Um, touch is a big one, hug your friends more, hug your family more, hug a pet. I know this sounds weird, but this actually does release dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine in our brain, which are all very feel-good hormones. Um, do you find yourself looking forward to that happy hour drink more or that evening drink? That can be a warning sign. Um, and is, Or is alcohol really integrated into a part of your life? Like you just can't even imagine going out to drink with friends or having a taco Tuesday without a margarita. Like that would just sound like clear madness to you. So it's a little bit of um, being aware of those things and just um, working on your central nervous system because what I hear as a professional when I hear the questions that I was just reading off my notes is 
I hear that you're struggling with self-regulation a little bit. So I'm sorry, what? No, please continue on. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things um, this new woman uh, talked about, she coined a term um, conscious sobriety, which is where you're not necessarily white knuckle being sober, right? You're just kind of paying attention to your drinking. So you might be thinking, okay, wait, why do I want to have a drink now? And you, you might occasionally have a drink, but you're kind of putting support systems in like, oh, wait, interesting. How did my day go today? My day was a little bit more stressful. Interesting that I'm kind of wanting to pour a big glass of wine right now. Maybe I go for a walk first and see how I feel. So in, in being conscious about it, you're not necessarily like, no, no more drinking because you 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 might be in that weird gray area. But the healthy point here is that you're taking care of your central nervous system and your emotions and really identifying why am I wanting that drink, and then maybe noticing okay if I'm cutting out a little bit less because I had just one glass of wine instead of two to three because I just went on a walk. Also paying paying attention to how you're feeling the next day, how your work's doing, how your moods are. So just you know, kind of that's what we call mindfulness, which can be a little bit of the gluten free and psychotherapy. Now the words thrown out a lot. That's what it is. And so if you are employing these strategies, if you're asking these questions, if you are noticing that you are in a situation where you're, you're craving a drink, you're not quite sure why, and you're trying to push yourself away from those behaviors and and uh especially if they're becoming habitual how mm -hmm. helpful can it be to then consult with a professional if those strategies aren't working for yourself to have somebody else there to help you through those especially someone that has a professional and a clinical background in these kinds of situations it's really important because they can really help with something um that we call um psychoeducation so they will really help just really explain a lot to you. And you can leave, I mean, even in an area where I don't specialize in, anytime I, I have some psychoeducation and a training, I kind of walk away thinking, wow, I'm really conceptualizing that different. So it can really help you understand where your patterns are, how to be more mindful, is it a problem? And even if it's a gray area where a therapist might be like, okay, so this isn't, you know, you're not at rock bottom, but let's make sure you don't get there and kind of help you implement. So it's really important to work with a specialist there to kind of bring all that psychoeducation because that kind of clicks in with the self-awareness, kind of twofold. And um, so then you're able to feel supported. And then, you know, it feels good when you're doing the work outside of the sessions, you're catching yourself, be like, wait a minute, why am I having a third glass? Like, this is what I talked about last week in therapy. And um, then, you know, you get that self-reinforcement of growth your insights increasing, you're kind of more aware of like, wait, why Why am I talking faster? My blood pressure's a little up. Oh, I, I might be a little stressed right now. We're joined by psychotherapist Ronnie Hormel from the Birmingham Maple Clinic, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. More information can be found on the Birmingham Maple Clinic at BirminghamMaple.com. That's BirminghamMaple.com for more information. You can give them a call as well at 248-646-6659. That's 248 646 Six six five nine for more information, or visit their website BirminghamMaple.com. That's BirminghamMaple.com. And so, so often we see, especially in creative media, but also in actual life, that friends or family or or uh, you know, colleagues, whoever it may be, that may be in someone's life and cares for them, may notice that someone is developing a drinking problem or has a drinking problem, and will stage an intervention. What are your thoughts on the intervention as a inter an intermediary method to address someone's drinking problem? Are they effective? Could they be, are they more likely to backfire? Is there some sort of medium there? So there is, there is a medium. I would definitely explore working with a substance abuse specialist if you are doing an intervention because usually especially if there is a problem right like like we're kind of crossing from gray area to, to pretty serious the person is going to be um embarrassed and you know they're going to hold on to that addiction and so it, there might be a lot of gaslighting a lot of shaming you're crazy you don't know what you're talking about i need to drink to be around you have you turned on the news 
So it needs to be done very delicately. It can be fantastic when it's done with the right therapist that really feels like, you know, supportive and can kind of help refrain like, no, this, this person, what I'm hearing is they love you so much. You're one of the most important people in their life and they're concerned. So it, it can be very delicate. Um, yeah. We're joined by Ronnie Hormel, th psychotherapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic, joining us on the Megacast. More information on their website, BirminghamMaple.com. That's BirminghamMaple.com. And so uh, as, as we continue on in, in the pandemic, it's a different phase now. Things are starting to seem a little bit more normal as much as they continue to go back and forth with, with one surge versus another, right. slight increase mm -hmm. versus another. The uncertainty is still there, but the normalcy more than ever before in these last few years is also there. And that creates a pressure situation for so many people where they are either through their own expectations just by seeing others out, out and about and that fear of missing out or FOMO or by direct pressure from loved ones or friends or, or other people to get back out there and, and have more normal behaviors and activities. That can have a big toll on people too and that can lead them to issues such as increased drinking uh, and drinking or, or even other issues as well. So what is your advice for people who are looking to get back out there who are seeing these changes happen to go back at their own pace as well as advice for those that may be that may be poking and prodding at people to get them back out with them as to not pressure these individuals into something that could really take a toll on them if they're not ready. Yeah, so I always say really pay attention, be the expert of yourself. We're all the experts of ourselves, but give ourselves permission to be the expert of ourselves and what we need. So, you know, me and you may have different needs and allow those also to shift. So your boundaries may be right now, you feel like, you know what, I'm safe wherever I'm at, whether you're vaccinated or not, I feel comfortable going out doing things. This is my safety level this weekend for, for the holiday weekend. For whatever reason, next weekend, you may feel fatigued, overwhelmed, hopefully numbers aren't going up, but something like that and allow your boundaries to shift. And you're like, you know what, right now, it, this is not for me. I, I'm not gonna be drinking or I'm not gonna be going out and that's okay. You know, because there can be exactly what you said, the FOMO or feeling like I need to do everything right now. Like, like this needs to be the summer of yes, I'm invited, I'm going. Um, that's not always the best idea because then we're not listening to ourselves and our boundaries and finding out. So my best advice would be, listen to yourself, be the expert on what you need, and also be flexible with that because it's gonna change. We're joined by Ronnie Hormel, psychotherapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic, joining us on the MegaCast. More information on their website, birminghammaple.com. That's birminghammaple.com. You can also get more information by calling them at 248-646-6659. That's 248-646-6659 for more information. And, and, and Ronnie, there's uh, so many other things that we could be talking about and so many other issues across the board that are becoming more prevalent or have been more prevalent over the course of the pandemic. Uh, if, is there anything that we haven't touched on at this moment in time that would be important for our audience to keep in consideration either as they're evaluating their own mental health and their own potential needs for intervention or just a discussion with a professional or any other mental health topics that haven't been discussed yet? Yeah, um, so this is kind of going to be an umbrella over a lot of stuff, but I think okay. it applies to often is we are, our brains are working normally right now by dealing with waves of stress between you know the pandemic um inflation ukraine stuff now you know we, we've unfortunately had a couple shootings in, in the past several weeks so people coming in feeling agitated insomnia anxious worried about you know their kids themselves loved one that is normal that is our brain working normal it's highly uncomfortable but you know you can feel reinforced like oh right these are things that are i should be concerned about i'm not a sociopath <laughs> okay so these are this is your brain working normal and you can use that to ease yourself if it feels like it's becoming overwhelming where you're struggling then with functioning you're not you're you're really catching yourself struggling with going to sleep staying asleep um frequent tearfulness crying um panic attacks um or or almost avoiding things like like you're you're glad if things get canceled because you'd want to stay home those are the signs when your functioning shifts to reach out to a to reach out to a professional you know a good way is to talk to your primary care physician you know, if you're looking for um, you're looking for some extra support, a therapist, 
Our clinic is great, BirminghamMaple.com, um, as well as you can even go to your insurance company and you know find clinicians that are in the area that are paneled with your insurance if costs are a concern and they can often give you a list with names and numbers. So those are probably the easiest ways. Ronnie, thank you very much for being with us today. Absolutely, such a privilege, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time and your expertise as well. You can get in contact with Ronnie and other clinicians at the Birmingham Maple Clinic by visiting their website at BirminghamMaple.com. That's BirminghamMaple.com or calling them at 248-646-6659, 248-646-6659. We're going to take a break on your radio homes for the program, 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake and 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills, as well as the remainder of our network. When we return, we'll kick off the Michigan Megacast with our Anna Bailey, who you will be seeing this July at the Ann Arbor Art Fair. That's up next on the Megacast. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. It's the Great Lakes water, and so what people do ends up in our waterways. Flushable wipes are just evil. <laughs> they should be thrown away. They're impossible to destroy, and they can cause significant problems. One of the main things when you're cooking is to not dump fats, oils, and greases down your drains. They stick to the sides of pipes. They stick to everything they come in contact with. Don't put it down the sink. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected, get help. We may come from different organizations, but we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Neighborhood storm drains carry water directly to local creeks and streams. No filters, no treatment. Storm drains also help reduce street flooding when it rains. So clearing storm drains and the areas nearby of trash and leaves helps keep them for rain only. It is easy to do your part by adopting a storm drain. Find a storm drain, check it, and clear it every month. So keep storm drains for rain only. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. 
We as Michiganders feel connected to this resource in a way that I think is really powerful. Conservation starts with a caring, committed community. For me, you know, it's peaceful to have a relationship with the river. Every single one of us has a role to make sure that those waterways stay safe and healthy, being careful about what goes down the storm drain. Just even eliminating some of your single-use plastic makes a difference. There's one water and it's ours to protect. Did you know that nearly 3.31 million Americans don't get their annual checkup? <laughs> Going to the doctor regularly is extremely important and is a crucial factor in maintaining good health. Make sure you are visiting your local doctor often and telling them about any health concerns you have. For more information, contact your local health care provider. This message is brought to you by WBHS Digital Media Arts Program and A9.3 Lakes of Town. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Joining us now is a wood artist who you will see along with hundreds of other artists and creatives at this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair in July. Anna Bailey from Bailey Builds joins us now on the Megacast. Anna, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Tyler. It's a pleasure. A pleasure to have you with us too. So uh, it's really interesting looking at your website, looking at some of your pieces. Uh, you do, you do, of course, wood art, and uh, you, you may, and your company is known as Bailey Builds. And so a lot of these different pieces are kind of malleable and buildable, and they come together into a full piece, but can also be, in their individual pieces within that larger piece, be individual art as well. So tell us about your art journey. What led you to wood art and specifically the kind of wood art that you're producing at this time? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, you know, it's a really funny story, actually. I wanted patio chairs from Home Depot and I didn't want to pay Home Depot for them. This was like seven years ago. And so it's like, I'm equipped to make my own. So I started making a lot of furniture and the furniture that I was making left a lot of scrap wood on the ground. Um, and I thought, I don't want this to go to waste. And so I started to make wood art from the scrap wood um, from the, all the furniture that I was building. So like I said, that was about seven years ago and I had just quit my job and I thought, you know, let's try to make this side hustle go. And so I started selling my artwork online and um, at some art fairs and um, it took off. And I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to make art for a living to support my family. And uh, my husband actually was able to quit his job after about two years of me making artwork because um, it was either like, I need to scale back or I need help. And so now we do this together. Uh, our last name is Bailey. So baileybuilds.com, that's, um, that's uh, where we sell our artwork now. And the specific form of artwork now that I'm making um, is part of my modern collection that I started about a year and a half ago um, as an ode to uh, myself as an artist. I wanted to challenge, uh, I wanted to challenge myself to use the simplest of forms to create beautiful and intricate pieces of wood. So I just use line and circle um, and by giving myself those parameters and those boundaries, I've been really able to flourish and create a lot of unique pieces. So where does the inf inspiration for those pieces come from? Because you are, like you said, you're using lines and circles and that's really your basis with, with the wooden pieces. And so I would think just as a layman on the outside, not an artist that's an, that's an expert in this particular area of art, there's just only like, so much you can do with lines and circles. So where do these ideas yeah. come from? Yeah, that's so good. You know, um, what's so great about giving yourself boundaries um, is that your perspective within those boundaries is infinite. And so I have been able to just really realize that 
everything that we look around and that we see is really literally formed from the simplest of, of shapes. And so um, it's really infinite. So I don't sketch anything out. I create in the moment. And so I have a piece of wood in front of me and then I have a bunch of strips of wood um, and I just, I just go with it. And I kind of let um, the wood and the design take itself to where it wants to be. I obviously am really also inspired by like um, Art Deco and um, certain kinds of architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, Native American design. Um, so there definitely are inspirations that I draw from. We're joined by Anna Bailey, wood artist at Bailey Builds, joining us on the Michigan MegaCast. She's also going to be one of uh, hundreds and hundreds of artists uh, featured yeah. on 30 blocks of Ann Arbor this July, July 21st, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., Friday, July 22nd, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., and Saturday, July 23rd, 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. in Ann Arbor at the Ann Arbor Original Street Art Fair coming up this summer. And so you've, you've said that you, are, you don't consider yourself an artist. You consider yourself to be creative. Creative, a creative person making art. Where do you yes. draw that difference between considering yourself an artist and considering yourself a creative person that is using that creativity to make art? Yeah, I, I just, um, I think that creativity exhibits itself in so many different ways. And through the course of my life, like before I started creating artwork, I was um, a, a musician. So I was writing music and performing around time, town. And so that was my creative outlet then. And, and now I've moved into this new creative out, outlet of creating art. Um, it was honestly hard, a hard thing to do. And I think a lot of artists hit the point where they're like, especially if they haven't had any formal training where you do call yourself an artist, you kind of feel like you're a poser. But I, if there's anybody listening, I would really, really encourage you um, to, to own it. Um, you know, I am definitely making a living and, and providing for, you know, many other people through the, the selling of this artwork. And so, um, just own, just own who you are and who you're meant to be. And if you're creating artwork, um, call yourself an artist. We're joined by Anna Bailey, wood artist at Bailey Builds, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. And again, going back to the lines and, and the circles that you're using as that basis in the wooden pieces that you're creating. There is so much detail with that because I would imagine too with but with manipulating wood into an art piece, you have to be very intricate in your cuts, in the way that you sand, in the way that you, and in the texture that you use as well, because there are so many different lines and so many different shapes and so many different ways to present those as well. So how long does it take you to create one of these pieces and just how intricate is that work to get the final pieces like those that are behind you for those that are watching this on TV or online uh, to get to that final product with that level of detail? Yeah, it's such a good question. You know, it's so multifaceted because um, you have to manipulate the wood to do what you want. And if you guys know wood or have worked with wood, it has a mind of its own. And so you just you just never know what it's gonna do. Um, and so you kind of have to follow its lead. Um, so I've had to learn, and this is an art form I've never seen before. So along with creating the actual artwork, which can take, you know, one of my signature work weeks, uh, works can take weeks to complete. Um, you know, you also have this whole process up front as to how to manipulate the wood in the first place to get to do what you want it to do on the board. And then there is the process of once it's put together on the board, um, the finishing process uh, is a lot of steps. What paints are gonna adhere to it correctly? What stain is gonna do what? How are we gonna get it to last forever for our customers? And so it really can take like one of the signature works that I make, which is all pieced together, cut together, sanded. I mean, it can really take weeks until it's actually completed. And a lot of that time, it might just be sitting and curing because you gotta let it do its thing and you don't wanna push it along. And so when you're preparing for an art show like the Ann Arbor, uh, or the Ann Arbor Art Fair, and you're bringing all these pieces along, you're trying to create new pieces as well that you can bring and really wow people at these, at these various art shows. And yes. traveling too, that, that's a lot of time to be creating art and traveling with that art and especially as you mentioned, giving that curing process time uh, to manifest itself. So as you're preparing for these art shows, 
especially in the in the east and in the midwest over the summer where the where these are where it's peak season for these how do you then change your process to be able to accommodate both creating these pieces but also the critical point of selling these pieces at these art shows to people that will really appreciate that art yeah um you know when we get into art show season it's just all hands on deck um, and so I'm grateful. We actually have a team of people that work together um, to make it happen. So my husband and I, you know, we support our family of four, and then we have um, eight, eight full-time, seven, eight, seven full-time employees um, that help make the social media happen. And so we have social media campaigns going to make sure that we get people to come out and buy artwork from us. We have somebody back in the shop working to, to get the wood prepped and the pieces prepped so that we can bring them to, you know, we have art shows like every other week um, in the summer. So it's, it's really been a remarkable journey of growth for our company because um, to do what we do in the middle of the art show season takes a lot of people. And we have, I would say one of the best teams around. So if, if I'm hearing that correctly, you're essentially taking your studio on the road with you and, and creating a makeshift studio in these locations you're going to in order to continue to make this art during the peak season. No, we aren't actually. Okay. So we always come back home. Okay. So we travel to like Ann Arbor and then we come back home. I, it would just be too much work. We have thought about like putting a makeshift studio up in like January in Florida so we can do all of those art shows but it's honestly a lot of prep work we have a lot of back stock so that we can just pull from that during our quiet months January February March um, so that when it's art show season we can just go and grab um, the next round of art to head to the fair. July 21st through 23rd in Ann Arbor, 30 blocks of Ann Arbor. You can find artists at their Ann Arbor Art Fair, including Anna Bailey from Bailey Builds, a wood artist, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. More information on her art, view all of her pieces, and see where she's going to be in Ann Arbor and beyond at baileybuilds.com. That's baileybuilds.com for more information on Anna and her artwork uh, as well. And so, uh, you mentioned that you're traveling and traveling to places such as Ann Arbor for these art shows uh, and then going back home to continue to create that art in between these art shows that you're doing every other week approximately throughout the summer. So where is home for you, Anna? Uh, yeah, we live in Duluth, Minnesota, um, favorite city in the world on the tip of Lake Superior. Okay, so right th right next to us there in Minnesota, yep. a neighbor of us here in Michigan. So then what attracts you to Ann Arbor for that art fair? What about the Ann Arbor community and the patrons of Ann Arbor's art yeah. fair? It keeps you coming back for their art show. Yeah, well, last year was my first Ann Arbor art fair because of COVID, you know, um, there was a few years off and then um, last year was the first one. Uh, we were blown away by how well the fair was run. Um, it was by far the best um organized fair we've ever done, which actually says a lot because some some fairs, it's really hard. You're like walking six blocks to get your artwork in and Ann Arbor, they had it figured out. We dropped it, our stuff off and we drove away and we set up. And also the patrons um, and the community there is really well educated about art. Um, they understand it. They understand what it means to invest in um, handcrafted and locally made things and um, so it, it really is our group of people at Ann Arbor. They really get what we're trying to do, how we're trying to um, make homes beautiful and um, shift culture with uh, the arts community. And so you mentioned that uh, you came to Ann Arbor last year for the first time, COVID-19 had an impact on your art show schedule in the years before yep. that. So and, and in a in a blanket statement, how impactful was COVID-19 on your journey as a professional, as a creative? Uh, because for so many people, they took that time that they were outside of their regular social lives and certainly their professional lives to take on more hobbies or to invest in their hobbies and their interests, including art. And so for you as a professional artist during that period of time, having that extra focus outside of the regular world or even the distraction, how did that impact your art? Yeah, um, well, it required a lot of innovation because how we had run our business previous didn't exist. Um, and so we had to really innovate. Um, and it also, like you said, it, it gave more time 
for us, uh, for me to be creative and to um, spend time creating new things and new designs. And um, But uh, from a business perspective, we really had to innovate. We had to push our online presence. We had to uh, figure out how to reach more people um, in the online sphere. And we had to, to educate them about who we are um, and to, to get them to the point where they would want to invest in a piece of our artwork. Um, you know, when you're at an art fair, it's that's a that's a really easy thing to do, to just connect with your patron and get to know them and tell them your story, and then they walk away with a piece of art. It's, it's a lot harder when you're doing it over the internet. Yeah, Michigan loves its art, Ann Arbor loves its art, and there's going to be so many great opportunities in, our, in Ann Arbor this July to meet a number of different artists, see such variety at the Ann Arbor Art Fair, including work uh, from Anna Bailey, who joins us on the Michigan MAGAcast. Anna, anything else for us today we haven't mentioned that you'd like to say to our audience, uh, especially those that may be attending the Ann Arbor Art Fair in July before we let you go? Um, just thank you for your support. Michigan um, forever and ever we will be back if we keep getting accepted into the Ann Arbor Art Fair because it's um, been such a great part of our summer show season. So we hope to see you this summer. Well, Anna, we are looking forward to seeing you this summer and welcoming you in from Minnesota all the way out in Minnesota to Ann Arbor for the Ann Arbor Art Fair in July. Thank you for being with us today. We're going to take a break on the Michigan Megacast when we come back with the recent school shootings and mass shootings all throughout the United States. We will, uh, we will renew a conversation with Dr. Chris Smith, the board chairperson of the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence on what needs to happen and what can be done right here in Michigan by individuals and the communities if our leaders won't take action in order to prevent gun violence right here in the Great Lakes State. That's coming up next on the Michigan Megacast. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. One, one how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. Parents do a lot of worrying. Get your kids caught up on childhood vaccines to protect them from these 14 preventable diseases, and you'll have 14 fewer things to worry about. Vaccines are safe and effective and save lives. So let's get caught up on vaccines and worry about something else. Get the facts at iVaccinate.org. We may come from different organizations, but we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Most of the pollution that goes into our rivers is carried by rainwater that flows off of roads, parking lots, and rooftops. The leaves and bark of a single tree can retain a surprising amount of rainwater. Depending on its size and species, it could be 100 gallons or more. It is estimated that an urban forest can reduce annual runoff by up to 7%. Here's one thing that we know can help keep our water clean. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, 
physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast where you'll find more inform information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. With the recent shootings across the U.S., including at an elementary school in Texas, a renewed conversation once again has been sparked about gun safety and gun violence all across the nation, including right here in Michigan. To, uh, to jo joining us to discuss some of these issues and more is board chairperson Dr. Chris Smith from the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence back with us once again on the Michigan Megacast. Dr. Smith, thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Appreciate having you on, uh, albeit not under great circumstances after the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas earlier on this week that took the lives of several, uh, I mean several children, as well as a teacher uh, at the school and so many others injured in the massacre once again at an elementary school. And so I want to start by asking you where your thoughts have gone in the wake of that shooting, especially considering so many, so, so many years ago in 2012, when there was the shooting at uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School in, in uh, Newtown, Connecticut, that was a point where so many thought, well, this, this has to be it. This has to be the thing that that causes a, the spark that, that causes the change, that causes those conversations to really get serious. And 10 years later, it's not. And we have a, another incident that is similar in so many ways and different in so many ways, but equally as tragic and sad. So where what are your thoughts or what were your thoughts in the wake of the news from earlier this week uh, at the time that we're uh, broadcasting this live and recording this of the shooting in Uvalde, Texas? Well, of course, my first thought w was, as you mentioned, how eerily similar this was to the Connecticut shooting in Newtown in 2012, almost exactly 10 years ago. The Newtown shooting was December 2012, but we're talking about, you know, essentially a full decade and an easy repeat of the same thing. And of course, you know, I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent, as so many people are, you have this empathetic feeling uh, about those families, about what those kids could have contributed to American society, what they could have achieved, um, such a tragic waste. And of course, at the same time, because, you know, in addition to being the board chairperson of the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, I'm a professor of criminal justice at MSU. So, you know, I've been very involved in studying um, law and policy related to this issue for over 35 years. And my mind, of course, immediately goes as well to, you know, what could we do? What should we have done to try to lessen the risk of these things occurring? Um, and of course, one of the things that really jumps out in the past couple weeks um, is you have two 18 year olds. If we bring in the Buffalo shooting, which is very fresh in mind, the Buffalo grocery store, you have two 18 year olds who could easily purchase weapons of war when they are not legally permitted to purchase a beer. Um, and that ought to spark some serious thought about whether and I don't view it as weather, about the fact that weapons are too easily available in the United States, including uh, without sort of safeguards and mechanisms to slow down the process um, for people who 
are intent on misusing them as quickly as they can acquire them. So, Dr. Smith, those who call themselves Second Amendment advocates, those who are uh, advocating for so-called gun rights, in the wake of the, these tragedies are arguing for those that are calling for changes and are calling out these politicians in particular that are supporting expansion of Second Amendment rights or no further restrictions or safeguards, so to speak, put in place to prevent or attempt to prevent these kinds of tragedies from happening. They're, they're imploring we shouldn't politicize this issue. But politics goes back to the root word of policy. Policies are put in place for the betterment of society, for the public health, for the, the safety and the welfare of the general public of the U.S., citizens, visitors, no matter who or whom is in U.S. territory. And so as someone that, is, that does study this, that does study this issue and does study policy impacts on issues such as gun violence, what are some of the steps that can be taken from leaders, both statewide and certainly federally, in order to prevent tragedies like this, especially given the information that we do know in the, over the past several weeks on many of these shooters, both in Valde, Texas, in Buffalo, New York, and beyond? Well, sadly, of course, this has become an ideological issue for many people. Um, and we need to look for ways to step back from ideology, uh, both in having an understanding of the legal meaning of the Second Amendment. I've taught about the Second Amendment for over 35 years. I'm a lawyer and I have a PhD as a social scientist. Uh, and also think about the extent to which research might let us reduce these kinds of uh, risks. Um, but unfortunately, there are many people whose view of the Second Amendment is what they wish the Second Amendment would mean, not what the Supreme Court has said it means. As we stand here today, the legal meaning of the Second Amendment from the Supreme Court's decision in District of Columbia versus Heller in 2008 gives law-abiding adults the right to keep a handgun in their homes for self-protection. That is the Second Amendment right. Now, we all expect the Supreme Court's going to expand it to some opportunity to carry uh, weapons. They're considering a case from New York right now. But there's never been a decision that says you have a right to purchase a military-style rifle. There you have a right to purchase a large-capacity magazine. There's some lower court judges doing those things, but not the Supreme Court. So this is really about the opportunity for legislators to make some decisions, as we do with other constitutional amendments, to find a balance between protecting the Second Amendment, it's part of the Constitution, I support the Second Amendment as it's defined, but also taking measures to protect people. And that really has to do with thinking about what are the weapons that are available to the public, what's the capacity of ammunition magazines, what are the ages, and, you know, for some purchases, not these, uh, the gaps in the background check system. 22% of purchases are private purchases that don't go through background checks. And then we have some unreasonable restrictions in the background check system that say, if the bureaucratic process is too slow and takes more than two or three days, you automatically get the weapon, even if you wouldn't be qualified to purchase it. And we know in Michigan from the Oxford shooting that if we have safe storage laws, we may reduce the risk of adolescents getting a hold of unsecure firearms in their parents' home. Not to say that it prevents those things from happening, but it does create pressure on parents to secure their firearms. And many states have done these things but Michigan simply is a place that probably is sort of in the middle of the 50 states with respect to laws that think about gun safety. We're not wide open like some states, and we don't have a list of things like some other states do. We're in the middle, but there are some specific things about strengthening background checks, uh, safe storage laws, creating a mechanism like extreme risk protection orders. So if there is proof that someone is in crisis, if, there is in, if there's proof 
that someone is at risk of harming themselves or others, their weapons can be temporarily removed until such time that there is proof that that crisis has passed. Other states have these things. We don't. And so uh, you also, as you mentioned, a, you have a PhD in social science. And so when we look at the numbers across the board in the U.S., and especially uh, particularly for our audience here in the state of Michigan, what sort of support is there for these uh, for these the different policies for this potential legislation that can go through at the state level and certainly even at the federal level for quote unquote gun control laws or common sense gun safety laws or whatever you want to call them. Is there widespread support for that? For certain things, right? So for example, if you, and of course we rely on public opinion polling, but if you look at public opinion polling, there's super majorities in favor of strengthening uh, background checks. I just saw a poll the other day, two thirds of Americans would support banning military style uh, weapons. Um, strong majorities support safe storage laws uh, and majorities support extreme risk protection laws. The difficulties that we face in our political system is that we don't have the kind of democracy where what the public wants will necessarily be reflected in the policies that we have because we have many profoundly undemocratic features in our system that permit active blocking of proposals. The fact that up until this year, uh, our legislature, like many others, could be gerrymandered by one party to ensure that they maintain majority control. We have a system that lets people become president when they don't get the majority of votes in the country. We have a system where we have a Senate that has a filibuster rule, so you need 60 votes to get anything passed, even if you have majority support. We have a Senate in which the state of Wyoming, that has about at you know 600,000 people, has the same rep, uh, a representation of the state of California with 32 million people. These are profoundly undemocratic things, which were mechanisms of convenience in the 18th century to get states to agree to become a country. But they are defeating our efforts today to say, let's get the policies that the public supports. We're joined by Dr. Chris Smith, the board chairperson of the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. More information can be found at Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence dot org. That's Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence dot org for more information as, as well as resources to learn more about these issues and do uh, some or begin some of your own research on these so you can form more informed opinions about gun rights, about gun safety, about potential legislation and upcoming events from the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. And so uh, the NRA always is a fact of the National Rifle Association in these conversations on gun violence, on gun laws, on changing the status quo of policy on guns in the United States, and particularly because they are such a large funder of so many candidates, particularly those who are politically aligned conservative, except when it comes to gun laws, where they tend to be quite liberal. Um, but. Interestingly enough, despite how much funding they are throwing at these candidates and these agreements they're throwing at these candidates, the NRA has filed for bankruptcy recently. How do they still wield so much power despite that being the case? You would think as they're having those financial issues, their power would diminish because you can't fund campaigns, you can't help fund campaigns, which, as you mentioned, another one of those things that's inherently undemocratic is campaign finance, a whole different issue. You would think they can't finance these campaigns, their power would be significantly less. Well, the NRA, starting back in the 1970s, became a very different organization. They went from an organization in the post-Civil War era that was seeking to uh, help people, you know, enjoy sport shooting and be, you know, better at target shooting and competitions and gun safety. And in the 1970s, they were sort of taken over by a faction that was very committed to a particular vision of the Second Amendment and maximizing gun sales. The NRA is very heavily supported by gun manufacturers, 
um, who seek to maximize gun sales. I mean, that's how corporations work in the United States. So they've given a lot of money over time, including um, in recent years. They're experiencing some heat now, of course, because of a lot of evidence of misspending and potential uh, illegal misspending by their leadership on travel and a whole bunch of other things. But one of the things the NRA has done in the past 40 years is they've cultivated intense support from a grassroots segment of the American population that is ready to be highly, highly mobilized uh, at the thought of anything that goes against their wide open view of the Second Amendment. So even if the NRA as an organization diminishes in its ability to run its PACs, they have a very highly developed loyal group that as individuals will send a lot of money to people uh, related to these things. And don't discount the fact that gun manufacturers um, can supply funding to other kinds of PACs as well, even if the NRA's uh, capacity uh, is diminished. So it isn't just that they gave a lot of money over time, it is they also cultivated and reinforced a segment of the population to be highly mobilized in support uh, of their views. If you think about people who are one issue voters, um, very often it's people aligned with the NRA who are one kind of one issue voter. The only thing that matters to them is maximizing the availability of guns because the NRA has told them to be very, very afraid that the government is coming to take all your guns. Hey, there's 400 million guns on the loose in the United States. Nobody could take your guns. And that's why we really ought to step back from that ideology and the cultivation of that fear and say, look at the things we can agree on, background checks, safe storage, right, that are not a threat to you at all. Uh, and yet the ideological rigidity and intensity that the NRA has successfully cultivated in a minority of the U.S. population uh, still maintains a kind of uh, influence, especially for politicians who represent areas where that particular segment of the population may be more numerous or more politically influential. On the other side of the argument, Dr. Smith, there are those that say, well, we can put all these safety measures in place, we can put all these precautions in place legally in terms of obtaining a firearm, but there's still going to be people out there that are going to get their their weapons illegally if they, if they can't get it, get them through legal processes. So what do you say to th that camp uh, and to that argument as well as answering, on, as well as what can we do to then answer that issue? Because it is a very real possibility that we put all these laws in place, we change all these policies, they do have they do play a significant help in addressing this issue, but does not necessarily solve the issue. I never talk in terms of solutions, not with 400 million guns no. out there. And there's no reason to talk about the possibility of future problems. We can talk about the inevitability. It's gonna happen, no matter what laws you have. We're gonna have a problem of gun violence. What we're talking about is reducing risk and harm. Um, so I don't disagree with that sentiment. But on the other hand, I would say murders are inevitable, but we don't say let's get rid of laws against murder because there will be some murders anyway. We work to reduce risk and harm and save the lives that we can. Dr. Smith, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it. More information can be found on Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence .org. That's Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence .org. We're going to take a break on the Megacast. When we come back, we'll speak to one of nearly 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Share Detroit platform. Coming up next, the community relations official at, at Penrickton Center for Blind Children, located in Troy, Michigan, will join us on the Michigan Megacast. Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's organ donor registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. 
By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. We work together to protect water resources for everyone. Most of the pollution entering our rivers is carried by rainwater that runs off roads, parking lots, and rooftops. A rain garden helps catch stormwater runoff. Rain gardens and their plants help dirty runoff soak into the ground. You can do your part to help keep our water clean. Learn about rain gardens and native plants. So consider a rain garden in your home landscaping. Catch the runoff with a rain garden. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was going to die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary, and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not get your vaccine? I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith. To learn more about the program at civicsnetwork.tv.com by clicking on our Megacast page and learn more about all of our partnering stations, including My Michigan TV. Our next guest is the community relations official at the Penrickton Center for Blind Children, one of nearly 300 charities and nonprofits that are supported on the Share Detroit platform. Jeanette Amos Ames joins us now on the Michigan Megacast. Janet, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Yeah, happy to have you on as well. Thank you for joining us today. First of all, just uh, give us a little bit of information on the Penrickton Center and the services that it provides to individuals in our communities. Sure, I'd love to. Um, Penrickton Center for Blind Children um, is located in Taylor, which is right near Metro Airport, if you're not familiar. But we work with children from all over southeastern Michigan and beyond, as well as northern Ohio. Um, the kids in our program are all at least legally blind. And in addition to that, um, they have other disabilities like cerebral palsy, developmental delay, seizure disorders, autism, a whole variety of things making each of our children very unique in their abilities and their disabilities. 
And what about the history um, of this organization? Uh, it, it's it's got an interesting background. How, how did the name come up? And, and, was, and assuming yeah. it's named after a person who did something significant in this particular community. That that's absolutely true. It's actually named after three very important people. Um, Seventy years ago, seven zero. Seventy years ago, the Penmans the Rickers and the Wiggingtons, so Penn Rick Tun, okay. uh, came together. Uh, two of the families had children who were blind. And at that time in the 50s, there was no services for children um, who were just, who were blind. And so the families got together and said, hey, you know, let's start our own little preschool. And it grew from there. So throughout those 70 years, um, Penrickton has evolved to work with the community, um, not with kids who are just blind, but kids who have the multiple disabilities. So in the in the mid 70s, uh, special education came to be. And so kids who were just blind could just go to school in their local school district. And um, our environment was really more appropriate for families who have uh, children who have multiple impairments. We're joined by, by Jen Ames, the Community Relations Specialist at Penrickton Center for Blind Children. Joining us on the Michigan Megacasty Center located in Taylor is one of nearly 300 charities and nonprofits supported by Share Detroit on the Share Detroit platform. More information can be found on sharedetroit.org by looking in their Find a Nonprofit se a section. So, uh, Janet, what are some of those programs and services that are provided by the center, and how do people in uh, Taylor and in surrounding communities in Michigan access those services if they themselves are blind or their, their children are blind or, or multi-disabled, as you said? Yes. So the kids that we work with are all between the ages of 1 and 12 years old. Okay. And we have three programs. The first is um, a residential program where the kids can actually stay overnight. So if they, um, we draw from about a two hour driving distance. So our maximum amount of time is Monday through Friday where the kids stay overnight with us. Um, and then we also have a daycare program like any other daycare. But once again, the kids are blind and multiply handicapped. Kids come in the morning, leave at night or come in after school and leave in the evening. Um, and then our third program, which you know, during COVID is, is actually really grown is our consultation program. And we could work with children that are across the street or on the other side of the world. And we'll do a, a video conference much like this, where we'll work with their families and their support people, um, teachers, therapists, extended family, that kind of thing. And we would try to do as much of an assessment as we can um, when we're uh, remote like this and, and uh, be able to provide some some guidance and advice over what kind of activities, um, how to set goals that are appropriate for the children and um, different resources that would be available in their local community. More information can be found on Penrickton.org. That's Penrickton.org, P-E-N-R-I-C-K-T-O-N. Dot org for the Penrickton Center for Blind Children. Joining, uh, joining us on the Megacast, we have Janet Ames from the organization with us on the program. You can also find more info on sharedetroit.org. That's sharedetroit.org. And, and so uh, where can people go? Uh, obviously, your website's one way that they can sign mm -hmm. up for these programs, but are there other ways if, if people do not have access to the internet or uh, are, mm -hmm. are unable to go through the processes required through the internet that they can get some intervention and some help from an organization like yours? Yes, families can always call us, but we also, um, families can just um, come by as well. So we are open Monday through Friday, and if um, we've had families that have just walked in to get information and you know to kind of see what the place looks like um, when, you know, when they're just dropping in like that. So um, we're, you know, we have a social worker who is full time, who works closely with all the families that are coming in. Um, our program is really designed to be a partnership with the families. Almost all of the children in our program have brothers and sisters without disabilities. And so our focus is not just what can we do to help a child be as independent as possible? What can we do to also help the siblings understand what's going on with the disabilities to be able to explain it to their peers, as well as um, to help give the parents the skills they'll need for the long haul. So for a lifetime of being an advocate for their child, um, learning to, you know, kind of dig up resources, you know, select different equipment they might need. Uh, so our, our focus is not only with the children, but with the whole family unit. So I like to always, you know, kind of point out that it's a partnership with the parents and um, our program. 
Um, I also want to add that our families come, I, I mentioned about a two hour driving distance, but they come from every walk of life. There is no charge for our services and the families qualify if their child qualifies. So we have families from every ethnic, educational, social, economic, education, uh, uh, religious, uh, every, you know, every family is very different, but they um, come to Penricton because they have a childhood benefit from our services. We're joined by Janet Ames, the Community Relations Specialist at the Penrick Center for Blind Children, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. More information, again, penrickton.org. That's penrickton.org, P-E-N-R-I-C-K-T-O-N.org for more information and to sign up for services as well. You can also get in contact with them by calling their main phone number at 734-946-7500. That's 734-946-7500. For more information. So uh, earlier this spring, the Pendleton Center became the recipient of a very generous gift from um, from um, Lincoln of Troy that is utilized every day by your center. Can you tell us about that gift and how it is utilized to provide your services. It was a it was actually a gift that was in um, coordination with the Variety, the children's charity, okay. and uh, they had uh, a, decades ago had given us a, a wheelchair van. And um, in the last 20 years, we've actually upgraded the, um, the lift for the children. Many of our children are in wheelchairs. I didn't really mention that, but um, because of the cerebral palsy or other orthopedic problems. But um, we were able to uh, upgrade the lift over the years, um, do some work on the inside. But the van was getting very old. And so Lincoln of Troy actually replaced all the tires. They did a lot of work that's underneath the hood um, to make sure that it's safe, the brakes, things like that, uh, to make sure that it's safe for us to go out and about. So the children that are in our program, um, uh, we want them to have as many real life experiences as possible. So not only do we have a fabulous playground in our backyard, we bring in horses and, and uh, petting farm kind of animals, but also the kids go out and about to the movies, to the restaurants, um, to the parks, to, the, uh, to a baseball game, to wherever you would go with any other kids. Bowling, bowling's a big deal here too. Um, so wherever you would take other children, our, our kids go and our staff are very specially trained so that they know how to make that experience relevant to the child as well as meaningful so that there's a lot of interaction. We have some fun events also coming up very soon. Can you tell us about your Ride for a Reason event and how people can participate and support your organization by participating in this event? Yes, thank you. Um, Penrickton, uh, we do not receive state, federal, or United Way funds. 100% of everything we do. So all this fun stuff you see behind me in this room, plus all the staff that make this work, the, the money that puts the lights on over our head is given to us by people in the community, individuals, groups, organizations. And one of the organizations that's been very involved with Penrickton is um, the Harley Owners Group, so the Hog Chapters. So Motown Harley, which is also located located here in Taylor, um, is uh, helping to sponsor um, our 22nd annual Ride for a Reason. And it'll be held on June 5th. We start in Dundee, Michigan. There's check-in at 10 a.m. and the ride leaves promptly at noon. Um, it's a nonstop ride. So, um, you know, the, the, the lights are blocked so that the riders can just have a nice leisurely ride all the way up to Taylor. Um, where it, it's about a two hour ride where, where there'll be some uh, music and raffles and food. Um, thanks to Variety Food Service um, for the food. We also have um, support to Cabela's, which is where the ride starts, as, as well as Motown and the hog chapters um, that are involved in some of the motorcycle clubs. So this event um, is very important for Penricton. It not only gives us some visibility because we're a small nonprofit, but it gives us those much needed funds to keep our program going and to make, um, the high, we have the highest quality um, services here for our children and their families. And uh, Jan, just another couple of minutes with you before we need to say goodbye today. I want to also give an opportunity if people would like to help the organization, what are some ways of, uh, both uh, financially and of course with volunteer hours as well, that they can help the Penrickton Center at this time? We love to have volunteers, which is how we're involved with Share Detroit, which is how this interview came to be. But our volunteers are very critical. We're a small staff. We need people to do everything from um, some um, mail kind of, you know, stuffing mail and folding letters to pulling weeds to 
painting on walls to um, uh, we have volunteers that are trained with our um, to work with our kids and they help us with our horseback riding program. So volunteers um, are, are very, um, very critical for us to be successful. So direct going through our website, we have a volunteer tab on that, as well as um, through Share Detroit. Um, and you can always call us as well. Um, so it's a it's a very important um, part of our program. So we couldn't do it without all the people that support us. Um, oh, and uh, so not only financially and with your time, but um, we also need things that, that we all need in everyday house homes like garbage bags and um, food. Um, our, our food program, we really um, work hard to take it, you know, take you know, advantage of all the food that people donate to us, whether it's fresh produce. Um, we had recently somebody who uh, donated a whole cow to us. They they had it processed and we got all the beef. Um, you know, uh, so anything that you would use in your own home, we would use here. So we do make our meals from scratch. So, um, you know, we have a full-time cook. So uh, that, you know, just donating food is, a, is also really impacts the way we can um, have our program. Janet, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your time and, and for telling us so much more about this great organization located in Taylor, thank Michigan. You. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure to be here. More information can be found in a couple of places. ShareDetroit.org. Go to there, find a nonprofit section and search for the Penrickton Center uh, for, ch for Blind Children. That's Penrickton, P-E-N-R-I-C-K-T-O-N. Or visit Penrickton.org as well. And again, Ride for a Reason if you would like to join. That is in Dundee. Registration begins at 10 a.m. on June 5th. The ride begins promptly at noon. It'll be about two hours as they travel from Dundee to Taylor, Michigan in support of this organization. That is going to do it for this week's editions of the Oakland County and Michigan Megacasts. Of course, you can always find us on our website at civiccentertv.com by clicking on our Megacast link. There we have links that will take you to our catalog of full episodes and every individual interview from this program and all of our episodes dating all the way back to March of 2020 when we began this program. And you can watch us online there. Usually these interviews are posted from each day's shows by sometime mid to late afternoon during our regular business hours Monday through Friday. And you can find them there but in the meantime, stay on our Megacast page and click on those links to all of our partnering TV, radio, and web outlets that join us on the network every single day. Learn more about what they do in the other 22 hours of the day, Monday through Friday, when they're not with us live and live to tape on the Megacast, as well as their weekend program programming and other programs as well at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. You can also find more information on COVID-19 and top stories making headlines all across the Great Lakes State by visiting our website and clicking on our local news page at civiccentertv.com. Uh, also, and keep up to date on everything you need to know on COVID-19 from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division, as well as other stories all across the state of Michigan. Big thank you to our crew that makes this program possible every single day. Our technical director, Calvin Brown, with me for the full two-hour marathon here in studio. Uh, Jared Clark and Larry Nyland are Zoom producers on this edition of the program. And the king of television, Larry Nyland, is also our producer on every program, helping us and our, all of our guests get ready for each and every show and be prepared to have informative conversations on a number of different topics. A programming update, we will not be back on Monday because of the Memorial Day holiday, but we will be broadcasting on Civic Center TV on their flagship, the Kego Harbor Memorial Day Parade. With that, we'll return on Tuesday next week with a new edition of the Megacast.